or Duncan? What's what do you where, where do you stand on this battle? So being in New England, you'd assume I was all about Duncan, although I'm not. I'm actually very picky when it comes to coffee, and I only drink two things, and that's a um, caramel macchiato or a mocha from Starbucks. And those are the only two things I can drink when I have coffee. Nice. Do you do iced? Iced or hot? Hot. And it doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees outside. Wow. I'm that way with, yeah, I'm that way with the ice. The caramel macchiatos are the best, but I do the iced and I don't care because here it gets very cold. I don't care if it's like negative 20, I'll still drink one of those. Yeah, that's the Duncan crowd up in, up in New England. They walk in and get an ice whatever and it's like negative 20 outside with wind chill. I love that. Kristen, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Oh, sure. Yeah. So my name is Chris Pereira. I live north of Boston, um, so I'm director of sales engineering for Front Finance. Uh, and prior to this, I was at Coinbase, uh, leading the sales engineering effort on the um, infrastructure side of the house. So all about staking and RPC functionality, as well as one of the internal Ethereum experts for, especially when the merge was happening. Um, and then I had a series of other fintech related roles prior to that. So happy to be here. And uh, I feel like I've been speaking with you. I know we are like besties (laughs) now. Yeah. But (laughs) I I don't know. I mean, you said caramel macchiato and some other stuff that kind of crosses my boundary of like, what is coffee (laughs) and what is like a dessert shake? So I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that, but we'll let let it slide. (laughs) We'll let it slide. Jason, what's going on? Welcome back. Nice speaking with you again. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me again. Um, I also actually would agree with Chris. Uh, I normally get like something like a caramel macchiato whenever I go to a Starbucks. But then uh, now that I have to make my coffee for myself in the morning, it's a uh, Costco straight black. Wake me up uh, hot every day. So Nice. Jason, Jason, you need to get the Breville espresso maker i invested in it in december of last year and i started drinking way too many caramel macchiato <laughs> that i made it. uh yeah we're at the we used to i used to have like an espresso maker uh and we just overused it and then it ended up like taking itself out and we're like fine whatever we're just we're just go to <laughs> brewing coffee pouring water in it and doing the, doing the normal stuff we're drinking too much anyways Jason, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I'm Jason Zhang. I am the VP of product uh, at Front. Uh, before Front, I was at uh, companies like Upwork and StubHub. And then before those, I worked at startups. I founded my own in the pop tech space called Homelight. Uh, and then worked at a number of other ones um, as a, in product roles. Um, uh, and, kind of, uh, and now pretty excited to speak with you guys. Nice. Thanks uh, for coming. And I do, I'll, I'll get to Arjun and Gabriel, but I do see Brooke came up. Welcome, Brooke. What's going on? Good morning. I'm just getting coffee. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for this, um, for this conversation. Looking forward to seeing what you guys are doing. But yeah, I- I'm going to go get more coffee. The espresso machines are life life changing, especially since it's really just me. I have an 18 year old who's kind of like off doing his own thing. Um, it's just nice to have like that little, little espresso. And then, yeah, if I'm out at, at Starbucks or whatever, what is with the caramel macchiatos? Like who doesn't love a caramel macchiato? I don't know. Exactly. Brooke. They're exactly. So good. I'm guess- dreading pumpkin spice latte season. Oh, like, get it out of here. Get it out of here. That, that's where I draw the that. line. I can't Drawing the line. Pump- it's so gross. I can't do it. <laughs> no PSL. Arjun, what's going on? Welcome. You want to, thanks, Brooke, by the way. Uh, you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your coffee habits, if you have any. Happy to. Hey, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, so about coffee, I have a go-to coffee, and my coffee is an eight-ounce almond milk cappuccino. So wherever I go, I've got to get myself an eight-ounce almond milk cappuccino. Uh, about coffee also, I have two espresso machines at home, but we, I don't use either. And I walk down to my local coffee shop in San Francisco in the Castro uh, because I love the walk and I love the people in the coffee shop and their coffee is amazing. So yeah, two espresso machines at home collecting dust, uh, but I still get great coffee on a daily basis. 
uh, about me. Uh, I'm the VP of engineering here at Front. My background has a lot of like traditional finance because I spent almost nine years at Goldman Sachs and also you know, crypto finance because I spent almost four years at uh, Coinbase. So more recently, before Front, I was at Coinbase. I was leading out different fractions of engineering from exchange engineering to payments engineering. And uh, that brought me to Front and I lead out the payments uh, engineering team at Front here now. Hopefully nice. Welcome. Welcome. And Thank yeah, you. and I, I, I agree, like sometimes coffee is like an experience, like if you have a good coffee shop that, you know, you could sp- sit outside, enjoy, the- it's, it's also an experience if you have a good coffee shop. So I, I totally get it. Sometimes I skip my Nespresso and go somewhere. I agree. I love the people there too. So it's a double bonus to me. Yeah, totally agree. And last but not least, uh, Gabriel, welcome. Hey, what's up? Thanks for having me. Pleasure to meet you guys. Pleasure to meet you. You want to introduce yourself and then maybe give us a little bit of your morning uh, coffee rundown? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my name's Gabby. I'm VP of sales here at Front. Um, prior to Front, I founded a company in the digital asset space, um, and I've, I've been in Miami for a while now. So um, I'm, I'm in the Miami digital asset scene, and it's been great to, to be a part of it and, and, and help build it. Um, in terms of coffee... Um, I love the conversation and hearing everyone's uh, morning habits. Um, I'm actually trying to reduce the amount of caffeine intake. Um, so I, I had an espresso this morning. Uh, that's that's my routine as soon as I wake up because that's much needed. Um, but now I'm on to matcha. So I, I, I made a, a matcha latte. Nice. Do you drink Cuban coffee since you're from Miami? Mm-hmm. No. So I've been living in Miami for three years. I'm originally from Italy. So I drink Italian coffee a hundred percent. I'm like Italy espresso kind of guy. Nice. Yeah. I can't drink that Cuban coffee. That'll have me up for like three days straight. If I drink yeah. that. Yeah. Go ahead, Dale. Yeah. Uh, just on that point, cause I think it's interesting, right? Uh, I have been here lately. There's actually caffeine is, is good for you, right? It's actually if you drink uh, if you drink your black, right? Obviously, you have sugar and cream. If you can drink a whole lot of coffee, it actually has good health benefit. Now, I'm not a doctor, so don't take my word for it. But most recent study actually came on the, on the side that coffee is actually good for you. Not coffee advice, yeah. Not <laughs> legal. Coffee. So, is it okay that I drink it all day long now? Is that all right, or should I? Stop Th- that's what I heard. It was a Colombian doctor, so you know, put some salt into your wine. Nice. Awesome. Well, yeah, the great, great diverse panel. Um, everybody is a coffee drinker, which is why I'm always bullish on coffee. It's the second largest, uh, tra- second tra- most traded commodity in the world. So, yeah, let's go coffee. Um, but, yeah, let's go ahead and kick it off. So who wants to kick it off and maybe give us an overview about what Front is and and what services you guys offer? Let's just do a little over. Who wants to uh, kick it off for us? Um, I, I can. Go ahead, Gabby. I think that was you. Yeah, great. Um, so at Front, we're, what we really are is we're bridging, we're, we're a connection layer um, between various wallets, exchanges, and then brokerages as well. So what we did is we built API integrations with with a variety of different um, platforms, both in the equity space and the digital asset space. And what we can do along our API rails are a variety of of different functionalities and features, um, like provide data aggregation. So uh, enable users to really like connect their wallets and then we can understand um, and, and get clear data around their transaction history, balance data, et cetera. And this fills a lot of different uh, portfolio management use cases, uh, but then also enable trading via our API rails. Um, so we, we call that execution um, and then transfer as well. Um, so enabling people to, um, to transfer assets via our API rails um, from, from various wallets. Um, and, and, with that, we've seen a lot of traction, specifically in the digital asset space. So working with a lot of different exchanges um, to allow their users, without ever leaving their platform, to 
to connect other wallets they have or other exchange accounts that they have and then be able to move their assets around freely. Um, and then a variety of different payment use cases too. So um, what we're seeing, especially in emerging markets, is that um, a, a lot of crypto investors um, and, and just users um, on, on these different platforms are, are looking to convert their um, local currencies, local fiat into stable coins due to the volatility of, of their local currencies. Um, and then once they've done that and they're holding kind of like their assets or their, um, their savings in, in stable coins, they actually want to spend them um, and, and spend stable coins directly and, and pay with them instead of um, converting them back to local fiat. So um, we've been enabling a lot of that like pay from your wallet feature um, in some of these emerging markets. Sorry, dog was barking. No, that's great to hear. So let's um, go back to the first part of it and talk a little bit more about the API uh, integration. Could you talk a little bit about how that works and maybe from a developer standpoint, and then we could talk about, you know, how that benefits from a user standpoint? Yeah, so I can, I can jump in on that. Um, so we basically make it very simple for developers to integrate with our solution. Um, our team has done a phenomenal job of obfuscating all of these direct integrations with different wallets and centralized exchanges into basically one API endpoint that's managed through an SDK from an end user's perspective. So a developer can sit down and in a matter of a day or two, have an entire um, like proof of concept up and running, fully integrated where users can interact on a web app or an iOS app or an Android app with the front interaction, this catalog of, you know, all these different integrations that we've built so that they can read all their data and potentially execute, you know, trades or transfer or uh, use these uh, payment functionalities that we've built. Um, so it's very lightweight integration. It's very developer friendly. Actually, let Jason and Arjun what, jump in as well. <laughs> I have one more question. Um, sure. Like, what type of like applications would you see being uh, being able? Like, what, what's the developer focus? I guess what type of applications would you see would benefit from integrations with this API? Yeah. So we found the biggest segments that we have traction in are wallets, exchanges and dApps specifically. So if you think about it from a wallet perspective, if you go into say your uh, MetaMask wallet, right? And you want to transfer an asset from Binance, for instance, right? It's a, it's a very difficult process to get assets from a centralized exchange into a self-custodial wallet. There's a lot of copying and pasting that has to happen. There's potential for, um, character transposition that can happen or transposing those characters as you're moving that wallet address from one place to another. Plus the user has to leave whatever the wallet app is, go to the exchange, enter a QR code, multi-factor uh, authentication involved too. Like it's very cumbersome. So what we've done is we've basically made it simple so that a user can go to a MetaMask. They can connect to their Binance account in the MetaMask app, and, or it's self-custodial wallet, I'll just genericize it, it's a self-custodial wallet, they can connect to their Binance account, select the assets they want to transfer, and then meet all security parameters um, that are required by Binance that are pers persisted through, and transfer those assets directly into their self-custodial wallet without ever having to leave the wallet. So it greatly reduces the friction for accessing your assets in other places because I don't know about anybody else on this call, but I have like a running spreadsheet of like over probably 20 different wallets and exchanges I have accounts on depending on the ecosystem that they're in, where they're staked, who they're staked with, if, they're, if I'm doing yield farming or anything like that. So trying to like keep track and maintain all of these like places or silos that I have these assets is very difficult. So if I have an easy way where I have a wallet that I can just go and transfer my assets to by a quick direct connection right from that wallet, 
it makes life so much easier and I don't have to worry about it spending half a day moving them. I love that because seriously, for ease of use, I come from a traditional finance background and it is ease of use for people, even moving from one institution to another, um, making that easy. So, uh, you know, when you have newer people in here, people that are learning, I was just in a space recently and the frustration for that person, I felt bad because it can be so confusing when, yep, you got to go to your MetaMask and do this and then you've got to go to this and do this. No, you got to paste this here. So what you have developed is amazing. So it gives them a central location to do all those things. I think that's awesome. Just to add to what Chris is saying, um, it should be obvious by now that we are, um, we are empowering other businesses. So if you're building a financial product, if you're building access to financial instruments or the, or the economy in any way, and you don't want to have to build a connecting layer, all you want to do and all your expertise are around your own business logic, that's when you work with us. Like we do the plumbing, we do the internal meshing, we do the, the we lay down the groundwork so that you as a builder can focus on providing that value to your end users while we empower you to do so. Uh, that's what that was a little high level and a little, little generic, but yeah, we do this via crypto, we do this via traditional equities. We are quite asset agnostic, but very, very crypto forward right now. Thank you, Arjun, for chiming that in. Uh, and then I guess um, from a user perspective, since you guys are working with different applications and, and things like that, would a user still need to like, I know with Binance, sometimes I have to like add my own API. Is that something that I would do or would the application itself like have that built in that I just click a button. Go ahead, Jason. I saw you unmuted. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that that's the beauty of what we're trying to be able to build is have it be very focused for the end users. So being able to let you use the credentials you understand, your email, your password, not have to go create an API key just to be able to move one single asset. Like that's the, that's what we're trying to be able to do is simplify that for the users. And really, um, you know, to Arjun's point of empowering, empowering uh, customers for sure, but also empowering the users to be able to have the actual ability and free reign to be able to move the assets that they own um, really, really easily and really, really quickly. Um, what you see a lot from, uh, probably every single exchange because this is kind of revolving around their business models. It's really easy to get money in really easy to get assets in, but it's not that easy to get assets out. They make you white label things. They name things in a weird way. They call Ethereum one place here. They call it ERC 20 here. And if you're a crypto novice or even like a crypto, like Ford, you, you do not know those, those, those two things are the same. Like you will not, you will not figure that one out by yourself. Um, and so like, that's what we're trying to like simplify is like everything should be, very focused on letting the user have a simple, pleasant experience with things they understand and common terminology that they can be able to understand. Love that. Yeah, I remember one time I had to try to do that API thing and I'm like, what? Yeah, and I'm pretty, I consider myself crypto native and I still, it, it was like making sure I did it right. And, and, you know, you always concerned uh, about the security risk with, with it. And I guess um, before I open it up to the rest of the panel, what are some of the, any security risk or, or concerns as far as like using that API integration or anything that you guys have done to prevent, you know, security breaches and things like that? I can, I can take that. So I'll address my comment a little bit about the pre addressing the previous question a little bit and this one. So um, we know that in the battle, in the push-pull of UX and security, uh, Web3 or on-chain might not be winning that battle as much, right? Which is UX is severely, severely suffering. And I'm not sure it's as secure either, right? But we're trying to make things better. We're trying to build products that are very secure. Um, and I, I just don't think our users feel the, the UX love there. So we're trying to address both problems at the same time, right? Like some of our products that are embedded deposit product, the one that you heard about quite a bit right now, it's actually trying to bridge that gap, bridge that uh, Web3 UX gap, right? Where users don't need to think about an API key. Users don't need to copy over complex, um, complex target addresses. Users don't need to worry about whether this asset can be on this network, 
or not, right? So that's a that's the UX hole we're trying to fill, and we're trying to do it in a very very uh, in a in a fashion that users have are used to have seen before. Now, when it comes to security itself, your direct answer. Uh, we are a security first company. We feel very, very strongly about security. So we're not giving up security for the sake of UX. In fact, everything we do is uh, is taken from the lens of a security first engineer. But there's one thing we like to say that everybody at front is a security engineer first. So uh, we are a SOC 2, type 2 compliant company. Um, we use Azure for a lot of our security measures. Right, everything is crypt- encrypted and encrypted again and again and again, right? So, um, and one of the important things is we actually don't keep access to any of our user credentials, user PII, right? One of the best ways to keep your customer data secure is not have it. So that's something we uh, hold dearly to. Awesome. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I'll open it up to the rest of the speakers. And quick shout out, because I just saw Trader Joe came into the room. A quick shout out. They are live on Ethereum mainnet main today. So congratulations to that team. Um, we had them on the show a few weeks ago. Just wanted to throw that in there. Um, but I'll open it up to the rest of the speakers. Anybody want to chime in uh, or ask any questions or comments? Go ahead, Dow. Yeah, um, I'm loving this conversation. Um... Uh, in the context of that is, uh, I had a farmer's market on, on Wednesday to talk about the, the DeFi class of 2022-2023. And a panelist mentioned that there's a lot of innovation all across the stack, right? The DeFi stack was the, the, the topic of conversation. So we touched on like the, the base layer, for example, right? If we have uh, Ethereum that moved from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, even on Bitcoin, we're seeing the ordinals. Uh, then we look at the protocol layer. Uh, Uniswap is moving to V4. Uh, I don't know, Maker is is adding real-world assets. And then when we talk about UX and we say, oh, there's a lot of innovation across the stack, it was still on MetaMask. So it's kind of like crickets there. So I, I know there's a lot of innovations, but we don't necessarily have that, I will call it the, the iPhone moment. But I'm looking at front, and, and it does feel like it, it's supposed to be that iPhone moment, right? So so I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to maybe like pick one out of the many that I have. But uh, it... I heard some of you guys came from Coinbase, and so I'm wondering if uh, there's some insight that came from working at Coinbase, or maybe you guys can touch on like the, how you guys came up with the, the idea of, of, of building front and what was the insight, what was the main key reason you guys decided to, to build this? Yeah, I mean, so I, I was previously Coinbase last year. Um, my unique the unique viewpoint that I got while I was at Coinbase, which I don't think you get from many companies, is because Coinbase is the juggernaut of Web3 when it comes to getting new users in and whatnot, there is, everybody wants to work with them. So I got a view into a lot of different protocols. Um, I helped launch SWE and Aptos and Axelar uh, among many others uh, that went live last year. Um, and then talked to a lot of the companies that are out there trying to get the ETFs passed and worked with them on the institutional side and whatnot. So I got a very interesting cross section of users and TradFi focused individuals and retail focused individuals and how they use crypto or whether it's a buy and hold asset for speculative speculative consumption, or if it's an actual utility used for payments um, in emerging economies and whatnot. And I think what I learned very quickly is traditional finance loves to just buy and hold or speculate. They want to, they want to play the derivatives market. Um, and I know uh, Coinbase has done a great job of launching the derivatives uh, exchanges that they have in the past nine months now. Um, they've, they've launched two of them, both onshore and offshore. Um, but that doesn't help the actual utility of crypto for mass adoption. Um, your everyday user in an emerging economy is not going to go and say, I want to buy you know, futures of Bitcoin because they're just trying to transact in their everyday life. And I think what drew me so much to Front and what Front was building was the fact that they were making the user experience 
much more simplistic when the underlying technology is so complex that the everyday user can't function with it without taking time to learn. And most people are not going to have the patience to sit down and learn and say, okay, I need to transfer Ethereum to my Matic or my Matic to my Ethereum, but wait, I can't actually do that because of chain incompatibility. Um, so I could lose this asset, and once they lose it, then they give up. So what Front's done is made it so simple to move assets between places and make payments and pay out contractors or other people for services so much so that it's completely obfuscated from the end user where they almost don't know that they're using Front's functionality. Like that's really powerful. And to have that layer of abstraction, and I know, you know, we've already been talking about in the Ethereum ecosystem about like account abstraction, like this is just everyday use abstraction for the everyday user. Yeah, I love that answer. And you touched on a topic that I wanted to, to actually touch on, which is account abstraction, right? So that was a, a big focus for Vitalik at, uh, at EFCC that happened a couple of weeks ago. So he's bullish on user experience being the the next step of or the next phase of adoption, right? Like as you, as you guys said, like for wide adoption, if you want to move away from the, the people that are on Twitter space talking about crypto and just like regular people, maybe in emerging markets, we need easier uh ux is their their own board people that don't necessarily care about the the details or right, implementation details uh, I, I guess my question is you guys like I'm, I'm still not that knowledgeable about your your platform how for someone who's in DeFi who care about decentralization and permissionless lesson uh, and you guys touched on the pii and, and paying attention to security how much of your app i would say follow the ethos of decentralization and permissionless so we're merely an instruction layer. So we're not actually an app. We are just powering the underlying functionality. So the way that you can view us is if a user is to log into their Binance account from a self-custodial wallet and perform some action, we're merely passing through the instruction of the user to Binance from the self-custodial wallet. So we have no contact with PII. We have no customer information. As Arjun said before, we don't, we don't store that. We don't see it. We don't touch it in any way. So we are, and I don't know that I would go down the route of like decentralized. We're, we're literally just empowering the existing mechanisms that are in place already. We're just making it easier to interact with them. Yeah. Like, uh, like a real, like a good example, um, is if you're trying to transfer assets out of MetaMask, like you have to go be able to figure out where <clears throat> the send button is. You have to go figure out where the copy and paste is from the place you're sending, come back to MetaMask, make sure you're on the right mainnet, then go and like be able to be able to like paste it. You have to like put the amount in, you have to like make sure that you're sending it over the right chain. You have to do all those things. And what we're essentially doing is uh, just instructing MetaMask uh, that you want to send $100 worth of ETH to this target address. And MetaMask's approval and transaction sign just pops up for you. And you just have to make sure that everything looks right. And you're like, cool, that looks right. I didn't have to figure out where any of this stuff is. I just push, yep, review, review, good, and we're, and we're, go and we're going. And I think like that's what we're trying to be able to really figure out and solve for is how do you make that experience simple for for people who have created these accounts and like have assets on these accounts, but don't necessarily know the inner workings of how everything is going to do? And they're not going to go spend 20 minutes looking this up on Google uh, to be able to figure out how to do these things. Like we can be able to simplify that process and be able to just bring up the thing they need to be able to take the action um, that they're looking for. By the way, I really want to say that I love that this question is in context of account abstraction. I think we should all do more. Our, our community should do more to make account abstraction an everyday reality. And uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how much of what we said was close to account abstraction, but you know, slight tangent there for us. Love it. Great questions as well, Dal. I'll open it up again to the panel. Any other questions or comments? Okay, Daniel, welcome. Happy Friday. 
Hey, happy Friday, everyone. How's it going? Going good. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Finishing my second cup of coffee already, so I'm all wired up. Hopefully just plain black coffee today, but go ahead, ask your question or comment. Yeah, no, so um, I'm all for uh, minimizing friction and creating, you know, improving the UI. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious, you know, as what uh, Front Finance brings, um, just reading through the website. And I think you, you, you explained it, someone explained it, um, Basically, it's just a uh, collection of APIs um, passing information from. Um, I'm assuming this is like a um, a wallet that that you have integrated in the browser. So, like all of those things, like ring, like bells, you know, alarms all the time. APIs is probably the mo the, the least secure <laughs> method for connection. You always have to verify that the API has not been modified or that the API hasn't changed on the other end to, um, uh, you, you know, to solve any security issues that the, that the API issuer has found. Um, as you grow, this seems like a, a big task to keep track of all of this. And, and if the, um, the end users, um, the end users are blind to what they're connecting, what they're using. Um, you know that that's even like is going to propagate the issue. Um, I mean, I hope you guys are successful. But if you onboard, you know, a hundred million users, then you have a hundred million users to to worry about with this API connect connection. So, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm all for. Like, yeah, who's going to sit down and look at the API and compare it? But but that's kind of part of it, right? So is there, in, in the interface, how does, a, how does one know that, um, yeah, well, you know, how, how, do, how, how do you give assurance? I love that it's just simple, like, hey, I can send money, it's fine. Like, I don't have to think about, like, just traditional finance, but... How can users get assurance that everything is looking okay? I, I can take this one. Thanks for that. I love the love the difficult questions. So um, maybe some groundwork, and maybe Daniel, you might have been a little late to the call. So we're not a wallet. Uh, we are an API layer. We are an instruction layer. And uh, what we do is we connect, uh, we empower builders of financial products to build financial value and provide financial value to their users. And how we do that is by providing a connectivity layer. And that connectivity layer helps us connect these financial product builders across liquidity venues, exchanges, wallets, et cetera. So we ourselves are not a consumer facing application, right? And yes, we are, and we do that via the use of APIs. Now APIs are prevalent across computing since the last few decades, right? Like even today, when we interact with DeFi, when we interact with crypto protocols, it's via an API, right? The APIs look different, they feel different, they're used in different ways, but they're still programming interfaces, right? So our API is actually developer first, right? It's meant to empower and power other developers to build these financial products. So um, from an API perspective alone, it's no more or less secure than your um, highest secure bank uh, API itself, right? Or if you feel secure using uh, using MetaMask to, uh, to converse with your RPC nodes, that's the same amount of security that the front API provides you. Why? Because we're using those same APIs. We're just making it easier for you to interface with those APIs. Right, we're just making giving you one universal API to be able to speak that common language, right? So, um, from a security perspective, if you feel comfortable using DeFi today, if you feel comfortable using custodial wallets today, the same level of comfort should be uh, should uh, should by transit transitivity apply to uh, front APIs as well, right? Hopefully, that starts to address your question. It was a fairly long one, so if I missed any parts of it, please let me know. 
Yeah, no, thank you for the answer. I think the, you know, yeah, it's it's all APIs at the end of the day, right? That's how you interact with, you know, how you can provide information out to the world and, and, and allow things to happen. Um, but in, in this case, this is this is an additional layer that you get building and and it's not it's not user set <laughs> so that that's kind of the question but um no i appreciate the answer um good stuff and, and by the way that that was a great question man like stay on the coffee stay away from tequila daniel because that was a really good question that made me think a lot I, actually i i, I would actually drunker, say you know i maybe you put some tequila in your coffee but that works whatever you did it works right but i, I would actually think to your point right it, it does feel like maybe there's some centralization uh, introduced by having a middleware and uh, manage those APIs. But actually, when you think about it, right, like a user is really going to be deep diving into the latest version of APIs. Would it be better actually for some kind of automated mainstream or like an actual middleware to, to update those API for you as opposed to you having to do manually? Like if you could get to a place where it's automated and it, they follow the best practices, as opposed to a patchwork of APIs over the place. So, so I get your question, but thinking about it, actually, it would make sense to have a middleware to, to handle that for you. Yeah, and that's the balance between making it nerdy enough, but not but but clean enough that normal users can can use it, right? If you want to bore someone, you don't want to tell them, yeah, you got to go to this website, copy this this thing, put it here. Uh, but you know, right? So, so, but, but they're in, you know, in between. You get, we get to ask all these questions, right? It's a middleman that's actually setting up the APIs for you. Well, that's awesome. So my, my, you know, grandma will say that's amazing. I don't have to do that shit. But I will have. But in my end, I would be like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, what did Binance change the API? Like, how, how do you assure that I'm not just like, how, how, how can you assure me that I'm secure, right? The, anyways, yeah, good stuff. Don't want to take too much of the time. Yeah, I mean, I think well, I want to ask. Um, hi, guys. I I think that at first I was a little, you know, confused because, you know, we are this is a, a customer facing show, right? But like the product really is dev facing. Like you, it really is um, something that that you want developers to use in order to create products that are customer facing. Um, if I'm understanding it right, because I, I do understand, um, you know, that it's middleware and the, and the, you know, interaction layer, if you will, like going bet between the two things. And then I'm assuming that you're, um, you're trying to be the, the middleware, if you will, of the best DeFi products. So a DeFi product can come up and say, well, you know, we're using front finance API to provide this, but it's not necessarily because I, I just want people to like the, who are listening to understand um, I, that it's not this thing that they want you to go download and attach to your wallet. And like, this is all kind of done in the, in the background essentially, but also knowing that a piece of technology, a piece of um, DeFi, uh, you know, application uh, has this functionality behind it, has this API for you um, as a consumer and um, and maybe you know for those tech people that are that are listening that really just love us for the coffee, um, you know, explaining what an API is, why it matters, what you know, what does it do? On you know, I could give a, a basic rundown, but I would love to know what you guys say when when uh, you know not not tech savvy people are like, what is it you guys even do? Um, because I do think we get a little bit in the weeds of the the technical stuff. Um, and I, there's probably a lot of confusion. So I would love to know how you guys uh, adapt to the confusion of sitting and talking to consumers yeah. about a dev focused product. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we, uh, we have definitely built out and we've definitely targeted is to be able to Go towards devs that are building, um, are they're building consumer applications that they can be able to uh, connect their accounts on. And I think the easiest way, uh, and maybe the the most um, relevant way to be able to to, to consider it is uh, if people have used in the U.S. Like people have used um, an example uh, an example for being able to essentially like have uh, uh, using using a like plat. For example, 
Uh, Plaid's like a really good example of like somebody who is there uh, and their client is the end business. Uh, but what they end up doing is uh, having you an interface for you to be able to log into your uh, banking uh, banking provider. And then what they're providing to uh, the client on the other end is essentially uh, your bank account and routing number so they can be able to so you can be able to pay for things on on their platform. Right. But like you are interfacing with something that you understand, you're interfacing with something you're you're interfacing with something uh, that you understand well um, to be able to do that uh, and on platforms like Venmo, on platforms, uh, on platforms that uh, you're like Coinbase even. Um, and what you're what they're giving the client at the end is uh, those uh, that account number in a very, very secure way, in a in a trusted way. So they can be able to they can be able to allow you to perform that action. Right. But essentially, like what you're what you're interfacing with uh, and what you're using are things you understand. So, you know how to log into your chain banking account, you know, like which accounts, how much what that balance is, what the ending four numbers is. And so you're uh, selecting those things to be able to, like, kind of make those decisions. And they're simplifying all of that uh, instead of having you going back and forth and trying to figure out what your routing number is and copying and pasting all of that. So in a very similar perspective, like that's what we're trying to also introduce to uh, uh, end users as well. We have. Uh, we have um, uh, very similar SDK type products that allow them to be able to authenticate and log into accounts they understand, be able to select which ones they want to be able to connect with that uh, with that company, and then allow that company then to have access to be able to allow them to uh, read the holdings data to be able to transfer assets with their approval, um, those type of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think that is also um, for, for people to, I like that, that, um, sorry, that's not enough coffee today for me. Um, she always makes me get up early. It's, I think, important for people to realize that, like, just like you said with Plaid, that great um, correlation there is that Plaid isn't something you, as a consumer, you know, go and download. You you use it because you trust it or, you know, whatever the case is, you see it and you're like, oh, this is a really um, useful tool to go in between I think that maybe in the crypto world and the decentralized world and all of us with our, you know, <laughs> paranoia, for lack of a better term, you know, how do you combat the, well, hey, that's just another piece that ha now has access to my Coinbase or access to my Binance? Because, again, it's a little bit confusing for people. We keep saying, like, you know, have self-custody and all of that. Um, you know, and maybe they don't quite understand um, the fact that the API doesn't necessarily have access to, um, you know, PII. But is there a, is there a more like s sort of simpler explanation as to why that is like to be absolutely assured that that this particular uh, interface does not have access to PII or um and that's personally identifying information for those of you who don't like the fact that we use acronyms in every single thing. Um, but yeah, I think that that's just another point to maybe go over again mm -hmm. is like, wait, this is yet another, you know, piece of uh, technology that's accessing my, my wallet. Um, yeah, go ahead with that. Yeah. I mean, I think um, uh, the, the easiest way to be able to think about it is all the actions that you can be able to take, within your uh, Coinbase app, within your MetaMask app, all the things that it requires you to do to be able to verify that, hey, this is actually you, This you actually want to be able to take this action, you actually want to be able to like do that, uh, being able to enter an MFA code, being able to do a double confirm sign. Those are all things that we're that we facilitate and just uh, and also and also require um, the same because basically all we're doing at the back end is uh, is sending that information over uh, to their APIs and uh, being able to and be able to instruct them to do that. So we need all the same verifying information to be able to do that as if you were to actually do it within like the application itself. Right. Um, so that's essentially like how we're kind of structuring uh, a lot of this together. And uh, as, as part of that, as part of that, um, you can be able to you need to be able to give access to uh, that provider for that um, for that temporary time. So that you don't have to you don't have to have them uh, maintain that access uh, and they don't get to kind of do anything they want through the course of it without your explicit approval.
we do love the word back end. So I think I think too one one thing that the web3 world has done very well is set up the entire like security parameter and security level like they've raised the bar on what security is so much so that I don't think anybody could name me a wallet or centralized exchange that doesn't require an MFA or doesn't require an extra step of authorizing a DAP connection via self-custodial wallet or um, not signing a transaction to connect that wallet somewhere. So any action that is taken to transfer assets, to pay assets, to move assets from A to B require the end user's approval again. So even if that provider had temporary access in order to facilitate these transfers, they couldn't do anything maliciously because that um, action would have to then be approved by the end user. And the end user would look at it and be like, well, I didn't approve that and just hit deny. And then no assets would be moved. Those are all great points. And oh, great questions. Go ahead, Arjun. I was just going to say a bad answer to this question would be just trust us. And so uh, I won't go there, but a way to think about it is we don't need this data, right? It's like, why would someone want to rob a bank if they know there's like $1 in the bank or there's nothing in the bank, right? So there's no, there's nothing in our bank, right? So you could try and rob us, but I promise you the, the, the ROI on that proof of work is severely negative, right? So there is no, that none of our uh, products rely on this data. None of our uh, revenue streams rely on this data. And uh, given how strongly we feel about security, uh, there's no reason to keep data that we that, that only ex exposes us more. Love Just that. trust us, bro. Like that, <laughs> I love that you said that, Arjun. Sorry to, to, to jump back in there, but that's what I was looking for. A little bit of like brevity, like, yo, like this is a different world than traditional finance. Uh, because in TradFi, there is a lot of trust me, bro, and people do. So, that, yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because I think for a lot of people, it's like they, you kind of have to harp on that a little bit. So appreciate that. Oh, great points and great questions. And we are getting close to the top of the hour. I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. But maybe I'd, I'd love to hear maybe about have you seen some applications or, or DApps integrate your product? And how do you hope to see it um, uh, different products or applications integrate front in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of different use cases gravitate towards this. Um, and I think for a lot of the reasons that we just spoke about and you guys brought up some really, really good questions. And I'm glad we were able to go deep in into some of the architecture and consumer behavior. I think um, I was as was mentioned previously in the conversation, a lot of exchanges are really gravitating towards this um, because we want to increase the level of connectivity and the ease of use around being able to manage your assets and move your assets on and off platforms and into custody. Um, a lot of custodians specifically are also working with us directly um, because we're providing the bridge and connectivity to liquidity. Um, so if you're holding your, your assets in, in a hardware wallet, you want to be able to easily move it off, off of that into a, a liquidity provider right to um, you know, trade um, or, or swap or engage in other activities like staking. Um, I think... What's really interesting, and, and we've been exploring this more and more, is again around the DeFi space. So um, working with uh, that, that are building around this, um, there's, there's some different use cases that we're exploring around that. And I think Chris can speak more to that. Um, and then payments use cases. So um, as, as we're seeing in emerging markets, um, just enabling people to spend their stable coins, I, I think, is something that we're really, really bullish on and, and exploring more and building more features around that. Chris, did you want to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think where where we're seeing all the track, you know, most traction is, you know, across obviously the use cases that Gabby said. But with the centralized exchanges, so if you look at like 
Coinbase, right? And I keep going back to Coinbase uh, for obvious reasons. But if you, if you look at Robinhood too, they're another one. They both built self-custodial wallets. And in the back end of those self-custodial wallets, they built a connection between the self-custodial wallet that they offer and their existing exchange. So effectively what they've done is made it easy through like almost a one-click option to transfer your assets from the centralized exchange to the self-custodial wallet and vice versa because they don't the centralized exchange doesn't care about care about holding assets on platform all they care about is the volume or the yards of business getting pushed through the uh, exchanges and venues because they're taking a cut of the spread or whatever fee or however they're doing it robin hood with their no commissions but you know they're selling to citadel or whoever um, but the point is they're going back and forth between their self custodial wallet and the uh, liquidity as gabby was saying Simply, what we're doing is we're taking that same ease of use and we're completely obfuscating who is required to use it or integrate with it and making it completely agnostic from an exchange, a wallet, a dApp, a whoever in the Web3 space. So we're taking a proven implementation of how this functionality works and we're stepping it back and I'm going back to the account abstraction piece, but we're we're stepping all the way back and saying it doesn't matter who the wallet is. It doesn't matter who the exchange is. It doesn't matter who the DAP is. It doesn't matter who you're paying or paying out. You can do all of that same easy functionality that Coinbase and Robinhood have proven are very successful. And you as a Web3 startup or an existing like you take like a phantom wallet or somebody like that who's like huge in the Solana ecosystem. If they integrate our technology, you basically take them and put them in the same bucket as a Coinbase to Coinbase self-custodial wallet. However, now they have their self-custodial wallet that can connect to Binance, Kraken, Robinhood, Coinbase, OKX. I mean, you name the exchange and you can get assets quickly and easily from any of those places directly into their wallet without having to be directly affiliated with any of the exchanges. Great points and great answer. Go ahead, Dell. Yeah, uh, I wish we could have you guys for like another three hours, right? Because there's so many questions and I'm still on the question that Daniel raised because I think it was amazing. Um, but, but real quick, on your website, I see the you have three different categories of use cases, right? You have neobanks, Personal finance, CFI and DeFi, and and I think we touched on the the integration between CFI and DeFi. And uh, Gabriel also mentioned earlier that you know you, you saw a lot of adoption when it comes to emerging markets. For and I live in Colombia, so I, I can confirm that that there are people that would just want to use crypto as a hedge against inflation, right? So uh, to your point, like, hey, my pesos is going down, I, I can you know put my savings into stable coins. I'm not necessarily looking to invest into Bitcoin or some other crypto to go up. I just want to have a hedge. Can, can, can you kind of give us, I don't know if you have numbers, but where, which country is, you see this use case applying and do, do you think this is like low hanging fruit for, for front, like the main use case you guys can start with and get mass adoption? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So Latin America is our focus. We actually have a team in Colombia. So um, we've been working with, um, some of you know some of the the larger platforms within the space, um, specifically in Colombia and then Argentina and Brazil. Um, part of that is, like you said, driven by um, volatility um, w within like the local government and, and when you look at the currency. But also part of it's just driven by by the size of the population, um, right? So um, you know some of these markets just tend to be kind of like the leaders within the region. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I don't want to like name specific like, platforms that, that we're working with or, or starting to integrate with until, um, like we, we, we do some public announcements, but, um, those are kind of like the regions we're focused on. Um, I, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. And so it's interrupt because I see, uh, NFT Sean with his hand up. Just last question. The, the last use case, new banks, does that mean that you guys are enabling, let's say on-chain banking or what does that look like for you guys to to facilitate onboarding or creation of your business. Yeah, so that's, I'm glad you called that out. So like with, with a lot of these more like, if you want to call it Web2 focused companies that, that you might see us announce with or, or different use cases we're working around, 
um, they're 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 looking at building out blockchain infrastructure, right? So, like with a lot of neo banks, um, they're they're building out different different infrastructures or use cases around um, potentially like having a wallet um, or, or dealing with like cross border payments, remittances, different payout use cases. So um, that's why we have neo banks listed there, and we're working with some like more of these like Web two focused brands or enterprises uh, that are looking to to dip their their toes in the Web three. Great questions. Um, NFT charity, I'll throw it over to you and we'll ask you to make it quick because we do want, we are at the top of the hour, but go ahead and welcome. I appreciate it. And I'm, uh, I'm very quick. Don't you worry. I uh, would say that just kind of coming into the end of this, uh, but uh, wanted to kind of ask as I was hearing a lot about, right, the PII data and, and other things and about how you're not wanting to keep that data and I was just wondering if you are facilitating financial transactions, right, that could possibly allow for these gains to not be realized by tax purposes, wouldn't there be some level of worry that an IRS or an agent like it would come to you for the data? I can take that. Uh, no, I don't think so. And the reason being is because the instructions are being passed from the end user to the underlying financial institution. So whether it's Binance or Coinbase or TD Ameritrade, because we work in both the TradFi and DeFi space, right? So the actual action is happening using the user's credentials as they've input on their behalf and being executed on the financial institution's platform. Therefore, the financial institution is going to have to re have to do all reporting required by the SEC, CFTC, the NFA, whatever it may be. And any type of action against the end user is going to have to be um, regulated through the registered entity, which is the exchange or the brokerage. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think that that's the like my initial thoughts as well. Right. Because I, I'm I'm obviously a proponent of Web3 and 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 love seeing the evolution of not just what you're doing, but specifically like in the in the entire space. Right. And what what this is going on. So I think that I, I feel similarly. Um, I just you know, I've seen a lot of things in this space over the past, I'd say, five years in particular, when it comes to the, the things that are trying to bridge the gaps usually that are going to kind of flip a little bit of the traditional finance on its head are typically the ones they go after and vilify and demonize and, and they they try to make it seem as though it is a you know the black market or it's a terrorist crypto the terrorists money and those types of things so i i i definitely uh i think that i feel the exact same that you that you said there i was just wondering if that had been um a conversation topic so i appreciate you taking the time yeah, great questions. Yeah, this is we got a lot of uh, smart people in this space and in this community, and they're going to ask all the 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 deep deep questions. So I appreciate you guys for always coming up and and you know uh, asking good questions and participating in this conversation. But we are over time, and I know we got the whole gang here. I know they got to get back to work. So any last comments or anything that's coming? I know we have. Uh, episode two of our uh, four-week series with a great panel on Thursday at 2 p.m. But anything you guys want to leave us with. And again, thank you for your time. It's been a great conversation. Go go to getrun.com. Watch us. We're building products for not just for crypto, but for the, the financial future of tomorrow. And we're building it in an open and um, distributed way, inclusive way. So go get some coffee and some crypto. Awesome. Well, again, uh, Bianca, Chris, uh, Jason, Arjun, and Gabriel, thanks again for coming. Um, we're going to keep it going for the second part of our show, but if you need to drop off, we completely understand. We know you, the team is busy. We're just going to be talking about what happened in crypto and NFTs, but we appreciate you guys coming by. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.